This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 343 of Horse Tip Daily, a different horse tip, a different equine topic, a different equestrian expert every day. Horse Tip Daily brings the world of equine knowledge to you one day at a time. Today's tip is sponsored by Equestrian Collections. For all of your holiday shopping needs, visit equestriancollections.com. Enjoy today's tip. Hi, everybody. Glenn the Geek back with you from Lexington, Kentucky. We have something very special for you over the next couple of days during this time and week of Thanksgiving here in the United States. I thought that, you know, when I started the Horse Radio Network two years ago, we had a dream that we would we would put out shows that everybody would be proud of, that people would enjoy listening to, that would be entertaining and educational at the same time, entertaining first. And I think we've accomplished that over the last two years in the almost 800 episodes that we've put out. Well, we wanted to, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do was bring bring the world a audio uh, really an audio history of the equestrian world. And we're developing that in our library of content that we have with all the different shows. But occasionally there's some special shows that come out that uh, that I'm particularly proud of. And that happened this past week with two with multitude of different shows, actually, from our morning show to, to the Western show to Stable Scoop, all the different shows. But there's some that I thought would be very inspirational to you and will uh will and I was hoping to expose to a new audience. So on Horse Tip Daily over the next 4 days, we're going to do something a little bit different. I want to bring to you a series that Chris Stafford has put together for the eventing dressage and jumping shows that she's calling the Inspirational People series. And what she is doing is over a period of, over the course of the last year, on occasion she has done some very special interviews with some of the legends of horse sport in the world and these are true legends and and these some of these some of these people are getting a little older the you know some of them this may be the last you know serious interview that they do like this some not but they're all profound, and they all have something to say. When I listened, she put three of these together this week in her Inspirational People series. And when I listened to them, I went, you know, this is something that I need to share with the Horse Tip Daily audience. The wealth of knowledge that comes across from these three individuals that she did in the jumping, eventing, and dressage shows this week is worth listening to. So what I'm going to do is something we haven't done before. I'm going to replay I'm going to replay these shows on Horse Tip Daily and over the next uh, uh, four days, actually, because on Thanksgiving Day, I want to play for you what I thought was a very special show done by by, uh, Alan and Tammy, the hosts of the Western Radio Show. Their Thanksgiving Every Day episode was something that you really need to listen to. It was inspirational. It was very well done, very tasteful, but yet made you reflect on the true meaning of Thanksgiving. So I hope you enjoy the next four days. Today, we're starting with the Eventing Radio Show, episode number 107. I'm going to play it in its entirety on here. So if you don't have an, have uh, 40 minutes, then you probably want to come back to this particular episode. But I highly encourage you to listen to every one of them. They are truly an inspiration. Uh, you know, And listen to tomorrow's, when we put out, tomorrow's episode for Thanksgiving Day that uh, done by the Western Radio Show. But today, it's Inspirational People series by Chris Stafford, her one-on-one conversation on the Eventing Radio Show, episode number 107, with a legend in the eventing world and a truly inspirational guy, Jimmy Wofford, James Wofford. And here is the Eventing Radio Show. Enjoy And happy Thanksgiving, everybody. This episode is brought to you by Equestrian Collections. They have a coupon code going right now. If you stop on over to Equestrian Collections during this holiday season, by the way, you can find all of your, you can solve all of your holiday gift shopping needs for that equestrian in your life at equestriancollections.com. 
They have a $10 off your next order of $120 or more coupon. Just type in Radio Show as a promo code, all one word, Radio Show, at checkout, and you'll get $10 off your next order of $120 or more, which is very easy to do when you're shopping at Christmas time for horse people, at equestriancollections.com. This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 107 of the Eventing Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you with the generous sponsorship of Kentucky Performance Products and Professionals' Choice. This is Chris Stafford in Lexington, Kentucky, and you're listening to the Eventing Radio Show this Thanksgiving week. My guest on the show is Jimmy Wofford as part of our Inspirational People series. But before we get to that special interview, we're going to hear about some of the products offered by our sponsors. One thing horse people look for in a supplement is a safe, reliable product that will address the challenges facing their horse. The employees at Kentucky Performance Products couldn't agree more. In fact, they feed KPP supplements to their own horses. KPP employees are horse people too, and the horse that matters to you matters to them. That's why each bucket has to meet their high-quality standards. Their formulas are fixed to ensure consistency from bucket to bucket. Only the best ingredients are used, and each product is formulated based on sound research. KPP supplements deliver the results you are looking for. To choose the right KPP supplement for your horse, go to kppusa.com. Or to learn more about horse nutrition and interact with the experts at KPP, join their Facebook page by searching for Kentucky Performance Products. It is that holiday gift-giving time, and what a better gift for your horse or your horse friends than a gift that will protect and support your horse. Of course, we are speaking about Professionals' Choice. At Professionals' Choice, they believe the more comfortable the horse, the better the performance. All of their innovative products are recognized by top trainers and riders across the board, English or Western. From boots to saddle pads, you will find the perfect gift for that horse lover in your life. Find them at your local tag shop or at profchoice.com. That's P-R-O-F choice.com. Our Inspirational People series, which is featured on all my shows this week, features one of the most popular personalities in the sport. So please sit back and enjoy our special guest, Jimmy Wofford. James Cunningham Wofford was born on November 3, 1944, in Milford, Kansas. He is internationally acclaimed as a horseman, coach, clinician, commentator and writer. A three-time Olympian, he was on the 1968, 1972 and 1980 teams, winning two team silver medals and one individual silver medal. He also competed in the 1970 and 1978 World Championships, winning both bronze individual and team medals. He won the U.S. National Championships five times on five different horses and won or placed at many competitions abroad between 1959 and 1986. Jimmy has served as president of the United States Equestrian Federation, first vice president of the United States Equestrian Team, and secretary of the U.S. Eventing Association. He served two terms as a member of the International Equestrian Federation's Eventing Committee, including four years as vice chairman. His reputation as a coach is legendary, producing multiple medalists at Olympic and World Equestrian Games. Jimmy was named U.S. Olympic Committee Development Coach of the Year in 1998 and 1999. He served as the Canadian team coach for the 2002 World Championships, contributing to the silver medal team performances at the 2003 Pan American and the 2004 Olympic Games. He is the author of books for training event horses, including Training the Three-Day Event Horse and Rider and Gymnastics, Systematic Training of the Jumping Horse. Jimmy rode in steeplechase races and numerous horse shows and fox scented for over 20 years. He and his wife, Gail Wofford, live in Upperville, Virginia. They have two daughters, Hillary and Jennifer, and four grandsons. 
Well, Jimmy Wofford, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being a guest on the Inspirational Series. You are indeed, of course, an inspiration to so many, not, for, not just for your accomplishments, but also for your leadership. And Jimmy, I'd like to begin, if we can, by the early days and talking about what prepared you for life with, with your parents and their values. Uh, I was born on a, on a horse farm in Kansas, Chris, and my father had, just before I was born, he had just retired from the military. He had been a cavalry officer all of his life. So I had, uh, I had an unusual upbringing. I had, uh, you know, any number of horses and dogs and cattle and pigs and chickens around. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, we, we were on this horse farm because it was next door to Fort Riley, which was the, uh, the cavalry school. And so at the same time that I was living the life of, of a young farm kid in the early 1950s, uh, this succession of very, very successful, uh, very talented uh, military officers and their, their wives and families would come through because when the officers would change their, their assignments, uh, whether they were going from west to east or from north to south, they, they always managed to come through Kansas. And, of course, they would stop off at Fort Riley to see all of their pals, and half of them would stay with us. So there was a constant influx of what later, later on became, after my father passed away, uh, these Dutch uncles. Uh, and they were, to me, they were, uh, uh, <coughs> Uncle Tommy was a very, very, uh, a very, very handy means of going fishing because uh, Uncle Tommy liked to fish. Well, Uncle Tommy was was Colonel Tommy Thompson, uh, two two time silver medal winner, uh, who had had a spectacular military career in World War II, uh, and we were lucky that he had survived it, given some of the citations that I've read of his for bravery. Uh, my godfather was a uh, for, retired as a four star. Army General, General I.D. White, uh, and he, he led the first tank brigade into to relieve the Battle of Bastogne. Uh, so these were some serious people that were coming by, uh, and fortunately, they, they took an interest in me after my father passed away at, at a very early age. Uh, so from the age of 10 on, I was basically raised by a, uh, a military family, and that I think, I, I, or I, I don't think, I'm sure that that I adopted many of their uh, attitudes toward life, their their ideas about about you, you know work, their ideas about telling the truth, uh, their ideas about service to the country. All all of those I sort of absorbed on these. Uh, fishing expeditions that I would go on, or or uh, Uncle Hiram uh, always had an inexhaustible supply of surgical tubing and and sharp knives with with which I could uh, build slingshots. And Uncle Hiram was Hiram Tuttle, of course, the dressage guru of of the um, of the 40s and 50s. <coughs> so I had. Uh, uh, needless to say, I had an unusual upbringing. I went from there on to Culver Military Academy, so there is a there's a strain of military discipline that is always ticking over in the back of my mind, even now in the early 21st century. Well, as you said, you were a graduate of Culver Military Academy. You were educated uh, at the School of Business at the University of Colorado, where you got your bachelor's degree, Jimmy. Um, were you a willing scholar who appreciated the benefits of a good education, and how do you reflect on that time of your life? Well, I, I reflect on it. I think I was lucky that my math scores were so terrible that I could not get into uh, West Point, although I had an, I had an appointment there. Uh, but I would have flunked out anyway, so I never attempted it. I went on to the University of Colorado, as you say, um, and I, I think that that was a good thing. I had probably by that time had enough military uh, upbringing and uh, needed to go on and, and sort of get on with my life in other in other aspects. Which of your teachers, Jimmy, have most influenced your life? 
Well, uh, I had two Shakespearean teachers, one at Culver Military Academy and then uh, one at the University of Colorado, and I love those. And they, they really brought my, my interest in good writing and good speaking and the use of the English language. They really brought that out for me. Uh, and, and then, of course, my writing teachers, Bert Denemothy and Jack Lagoff, were enormous influences in my life. Tell us about uh, the early days of your riding career, Jimmy. How did horses become a part of your life, and what was your family's reaction to your lifestyle with horses? Uh, my, my, taking that backwards, my family's reaction to my, to my lifestyle choice was just to shrug, because you, you have to understand that, that I lived on a horse farm. My father had been on the Olympic team as a show jumper in 1932, my oldest brother had been on the Olympic team in 1952. Uh, my middle brother had been reserved to the Olympic team in 1956. And then my sister-in-law was on the British show jumping team in 1960. And so when I came along in 68, it was basically their reaction was sort of, what took you so long, kid? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, wasn't, it was not a surprise to the family that I was going to do this because this was sort of a family, this was a family concern. Well, you're obviously an established horseman and a clinician and an educator, a, a, an author, so many different things in life, Jimmy. But what would you perceive to be your greatest strengths and weaknesses? Uh, I, I think my greatest strength is that I, I enjoy reading about uh, about equestrian theory, and so I'm I'm not as well grounded in it as as Bill Steinkraus is because I cannot read in foreign languages, uh, which he can, and that's an enormous advantage. However, uh, the the work that is available to me, I have read, and so. Uh, I mean, when people start to talk about the basic texts of, you know, for example, the Advanced German Handbook of Riding, which is a super, super work uh, on on the riding and training horses, uh, I can point out to them the influences of Steinbrecht and Musler because I've read Steinbrecht and Musler. Uh, and the, you know, the works I, I consider the foundational theory here in the United States to be Colonel Chamberlain's works. And uh, if, when you look at them they, and, and read them, then you start to realize uh, the influence, say, that, that de Carpentry had on the development of the U.S. School of Writing, General de Carpentry in, from France. Uh, who wrote a wonderful book called Academic Equitation, and and so my, I'm going on a little bit because it's a uh, it's a passion of mine. But I think that my greatest uh, my my greatest strength is that I understand the theoretical reasons for training horses in certain ways. In addition, I have not uh, because of my curiosity about horses, I have not. Uh, I have not, let's say, painted myself in a corner. I read, I read deeply into the Germanic school of, of training and writing. I've read deeply into the Romantic uh, school, the French and Italian schools uh, of writing. And I've come to the conclusion that, that they can both be, both sides of the coin can be right and both sides can be wrong, given the particular horse that you have to deal with and that's the key because if you want to be a good horseman you're going to take you're going to take your horse as he is today and, and hopefully improve him just a little bit you are highly regarded and respected jimmy for your morals your principles and your integrity but what do you most value in life what what do i most value in life i i think doing the right thing with with your family doing the right thing for your uh, society and doing the right thing for your horses. Who inspires you? Oh, in um, in, in riding, you know these these uh, these riders that are riding now are are inspirations to me. Mark Mark Todd set the 
set the standard, you know, for the late half of the 20th century. And, and now we've got William Fox Pitt and Michael Young and all of these people coming on that ride at such a wonderful standard. You know, Kevin Freeman and I, Kevin was on the U.S. team with me back in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, and we were watching some of my old family films one night. And uh, they were, they were, let's say, they were pretty amateurish. And uh, uh, so Kevin and I, we watched each other compete in 1968. And we watched each other compete on film here in 1972. And then the, the film shut down. And Kevin, who, who has the most wonderful sense of humor, he leaned back and he said, goodness, Jimmy, he said, you know, the... The the funny thing about watching these films is is not how bad we were, but how good we thought we were. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very true. And and you know it's not totally wrong because we were the state of the art in 1968 and in 1972. Uh, but the art of writing and and certainly the art of competing and eventing has has progressed far beyond what we were capable of producing. Well, as you mentioned there, your Olympic accomplishments, uh, of course, being on the team and um, winning two team silver medals and an individual silver medal, Jimmy, um, of all your life's accomplishments, uh, which are you most proud of? Uh, I'm probably most proud of my, my individual silver uh, in 1980 with Carowich because uh, for two reasons. Number one, he was my, my favorite horse. Uh, I, I, I felt a connection with that horse the first time I ever saw him. They led him past me before I purchased him. They led him past me in the courtyard at badminton. And, and I was standing right on the rope and waiting for the, the vet inspection to start. Uh, and this horse stopped. I was standing on his offside, and he suddenly swung his head and neck and he looked right at me, and I don't usually anthropomorphize horses, but this horse made eye contact with me, and he did that for what seemed like an hour and was probably, you know, 15 to 30 seconds that he just stood and looked at me. And the, the groom tugged on him several times, and he did not move. He just stood there. And then suddenly he just kind of shrugged his shoulders and, and walked on, and I was standing next to Lars Sederholm. This this was in the spring of of 1977, and I, I, I was standing next to Lars, and I tugged on his arm, and I said, "Lars, who is that creature?" And he had not been watching. He and he turned back and looked, and he said, "Oh yes," he said, "That's that's Carowitz." He said, "But you know, he knew I was shopping for horses at the time, uh, but he said you, you'll never buy that horse. That horse won't be for sale." And I said, "Oh, okay." And I, I sort of, uh, I sort of forgot about the horse. I watched the horse run the next day, and he was phenomenal. And he, then you know, he kind of dropped out of my my consciousness. And so I continued look looking for horses that spring and summer because I did not have a horse that I could ride in the World Championships in 1978. And I was getting to be of an age then that if I didn't compete in the World Games in 78, probably my career was over because we did not go on as long as riders do these days. Uh, so by the time you were 40, you were pretty much out of the you were pretty much out of the deal as a competitor. Uh, and and anyway, to com to complicate things in those days, one the owner and the rider had to be from the same country in in 1978 and so i i had another 30 days uh to go and i was already thinking to myself well i've had a good run of it i i have not been able to compete as well as i wanted at the level that i wanted uh but i've had an unusual career i've been to two olympics you know it is what it is and in the meantime Lars setterholm called me about the first of december and and I had I had been in touch with him about some lower level horses that I was buying for clients, and he said, "Oh, by the way, you'll never guess who I just uh, hung up on the phone with was Carowich's owner, uh, because they're going to sell Carowich." And I said, "Really?" 
Yes, the, the Allie Patterson, the rider, is pregnant, and so they're going to go ahead and sell a horse. And I said, well, tell the, call them back and tell them that he is purchased pending a vet exam. And that's that's what I did. I bought the horse before the end of the year, uh, untried and and uh, uh, basically sight unseen, other than that I had seen him go cross country and show jumping at at badminton. And when he arrived the next uh, the the first week of January, when he arrived and I got a leg up on him uh, and sat down onto him, it I felt as if I had put on a glove. And he he just suited me, you know, mentally and physically. And so I I enjoyed him, and and uh, that that's the backstory. And the reason I'm proudest of my individual silver at uh, the alternate Olympics at Fontainebleau in in uh, 1980 is that uh, he basically ran away with me on the cross country, and I had enough sense. Uh, not to fight with him. He was a superb uh, cross-country horse. And I had enough sense to, to trust him and to know that he knew what he was doing. And as it turned out, he had the fastest round of the day. And uh, uh, we won the silver medal there. And, and I've always been proud of that one, that that I had had this mystical uh, connection with this horse before I purchased him which turned out to be uh, accurate and complete. And then, too, that that on the day for a rider who by that time was one of the most experienced riders in the world, uh, and I would like to think fairly skillful by that time, uh, that I had enough sense to say to my horse, okay, this was not what I had planned because I was the first rider. Uh, and, you know, the first rider in a team competition is not supposed to to turn in the fastest round of the day. Uh, but I had enough sense to say, you know, this is what my horse is going to do, and if I try and fight with him, I'll mess him up, so away we go. Uh, and it was a marvelous experience, and, and uh, I think a great story. Hor- horses change your life, Chris. They really do. Well, that story gave me goosebumps, Jimmy. Uh, what actually gives you goosebumps? Oh, about about every two or three years, I see someone riding so well that that I get goosebumps. Uh, I get goosebumps when I uh, see a flight of ducks coming in to where my Labrador and I are sitting behind a tree, and uh, I get goosebumps when I have a very very nice dry fly bobbing down the river, and it's about to pass over where I know an extremely large trout is is staying, uh, and th- those are the situations these days that give me goosebumps. Um, I laugh because I have four grandsons now, and they they make me laugh uh, every day of my life now because they, of the stunts that they get up to because they're boys. I raised two daughters, and now I'm in the process of watching four boys be raised, and it's a different process, I must say. And what upsets you? Uh, what upsets me, uh, uh, brutality, uh, confrontation with, with horses. I really, really disapprove of that. Uh, and, and, uh, dishonest people. You know, I avoid dishonest horses and I avoid dishonest people. Well, you have a a wonderful reputation, Jimmy, for producing, for helping, for training so many students that have gone on to the finest accolades in equestrian sport. Uh, A lot of those young people. It begs the question, Jimmy, what motivates you to invest in youth? Uh, I think that it's a sense of obligation to a sport that has given me so much. Uh, that has defined my life, really. You know, I've spent my life being defined as a horseman. Uh, and the if if we are going to care for horses, I can't directly care for them anymore by, by riding them myself, but I can certainly pass on the the lessons that I have learned uh, over, over quite a few years now. Uh, and I get an enormous kick out of watching riders develop and knowing that I helped accelerate and and uh, and and improve their progress partially by preventing them from making the mistakes that I made in the past when I was their age at, at their skill level. 
What gives you the most meaning to your life now, Jimmy, when you reflect on a life well spent? Uh, you know, I don't do much of that, Chris, because I still uh, I'm still actively involved in the in the training of event horses on a daily basis. I don't run a I don't run a full time program uh, here at my barn. I have rented my barn out, uh, but I do many clinics around uh, my area, sort of in a 40 or 50 mile radius. I do about three of those a week, and then I'm gone every weekend uh, teaching a clinic. Uh, someplace all over the country. Do you have a li- Do you have a life not, motto, Jimmy, that's helped you with your career? I'm, I say that again. Do you have a life motto that has helped you with you, your career? Uh, no, I mean the the cavalry officers that I dealt with uh, wanted me to ride hard, shoot straight, and always tell the truth. And. <laughs> Uh, except for the part of me being a fisherman, I, I would like to think that I got the first two. Uh, and for the most part, I've got the third about that always tell the truth. But fishermen are not testifying under oath. So <laughs> um, sometimes there might be a, a slight element of fabrication involved. <laughs> Does anything intimidate you, Jimmy? Uh, no, not really. But how do you overcome adversity, as I'm sure you must have done in life? Uh, you just be, you have to shrug and say, "Yeah, times are tough. Oh well, let's let's get going. Let's get out of this." We, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I just I have always had a a desire to go ahead. I read a great deal of history. I've read a great deal and and lived through a great deal of the history of the horse world at at the Olympic discipline, you know, at that competitive level. And anyone that has done that has has gotten there through through highs as well as lows. And I think you you learn more from the lows. Any athlete tells you that you learn more from your losses than your wins. Well, you mentioned your four grandchildren as being a great source of amusement to you. But what else or or who else would entertain you and make you laugh? Uh, entertain me and make me laugh. Uh, that's that's not hard uh, because <laughs> I have an overdeveloped sense of humor. So so even mildly amusing situations are are just fine with me. I mean, horses make me laugh every day because they they react in ways that that we're not ready for. You know, they they live to a certain extent in a parallel universe. They they don't perceive the world exactly the way we do. Uh, because we're predators and they're prey, and and so they they have they do things that we are not ready for, and they they can be minor or they can involve suddenly very very placid horses, which is happening around here now uh, because we're getting our first frost of the season, and so some very very quiet, phlegmatic, wonderful school ponies have just launched their launched their riders uh, just in an excess of of good spirits brought on by the weather and the leaves are blowing and it's a little bit nippy and suddenly these placid creatures have turned into these fire-breathing dragons and <laughs> some of my students haven't been ready for that but but that's okay too that's all part of the process of learning to ride and and you know as I help them up and put them back on I, I tell them that it's not it's not important that they got bucked off it's just important that they get back on and keep going and they do. Well, aside for catching that elusive trout or finishing on your dressage score, Jimmy, do you do you have a constant source of joy? Uh, yes, that I get to I get to get up every morning, and and my life is devoted to some aspect of horses, whether it's actually uh, standing out in the arena, supervising, uh, mentoring. This this email is a. It's a mixed blessing, but but I am able to stay in better contact now with students around the country. I view their, uh, I can view much of their performance on video uh, because of this uh, YouTube uh, thing where I can go and and sign on and and look up someone's performance. Uh, I I get up early in the morning. I do my writing mostly before daybreak uh, because I write a monthly column for Practical Horsemen. 
and I enjoyed that. The the editors are very tolerant with me. They don't uh, they don't assign me topics uh, very often. About about twice a year, the the word will come down from on high that we we need an article about this to go with the Rolex issue or to go with the this year we had a World Equestrian Games issue. Uh, and they needed an article about that, but but that was fine. I would have wanted to, uh, I would have wanted to write about it anyway, and I'm enjoying that greatly. I've got another book coming out next spring, hopefully in the spring of 2011. Uh, so you know, I'm in I'm involved in all all aspects of it. Who is your biggest supporter, Jimmy, and what does that mean to you? Uh, you you have to know that I've been married to the same girl for over 40 years now, my wife, Gail, uh, who has stood by me through the highs and the lows of this and managed to raise two gorgeous daughters and four rapscallion grandsons now in the process. So we have, we have to tip our hat to her to, to be able to keep the family together while I was going through all of these life experiences. Have you experienced a, a single event, Jimmy, that has changed your life? Uh, I mean, e each one to a certain extent does. I, I think that the first time you ride in the Olympics, no matter how well or how badly you do, that that's sort of the benchmark. You know, the famous football player, Alex Karras, they asked him the next day, what what does it mean to win the Super Bowl, the, the American football Super Bowl? What does it mean to win that title and to be awarded that ring? And he said the Super Bowl is a great thing because once once you play in the Super Bowl, you never have to apologize for your playing ever again because you have shown the world that you can ride at a certain level. And I think there's an element of that in in riding in the Olympics, you know, that the, for the rest of your life, on your resume, it will be so-and-so, so-and-so, Olympic rider at the XX Olympics uh, said the other day. You know, it just it, it's just something that's going to be permanently attached to your resume and, and permanently woven into the fabric of your life. Well, Jimmy, you're known for the books. You mentioned you have a new book coming out, and you're also known not just as an author but a great reader of literature. So what books would you be reading now? Uh, I, just, I just finished a very interesting book on the, uh, the massacre at Wounded Knee, the Battle of Wounded Knee, called The Last Stand by a man named Nathaniel Philbrick. Uh, and my, my next serious book on history will be uh, a life of General Walter Beadle Smith, who was Dwight Eisenhower's chief of staff during World War II. Uh, and I know about him. My family knew him a bit, uh, but he was an infantry officer, and, and therefore, you know, cavalry officers looked down their nose at them just a little bit. <laughs> that's 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 a little bit of a joke, but, but they moved in different circles. So... Uh, most of these World War II guys, uh, many of them were, were family friends. You know, my father played polo with Patton and Wainwright, uh, and, and all of these guys knew each other going into World War II, much, much in the same way that Lee and Grant uh, during the Civil War knew. They knew their opposite. Uh, their, their, they knew the opponent on the other side of the battle line pretty well. They might have gone to West Point with them. Uh, so that that part of the history uh, interests me. My my periods, as as one might imagine from from the beginning of this show, uh, my interests are are in military history and biography, especially the American Civil War uh, and and World War Two. So that's that's what I'll be reading next. Uh, but you you also might catch me with some horrible, dreadful cowboy novel in my hand. I'm a speed reader, so I, I go through stuff pretty quickly. Uh, but the, but those, are, those are the serious ones. Does music and the arts have a place in your life? Uh, you know, I'm, I, I think that most horsemen are musical in the sense that they have an innate sense of rhythm, but I never, 
I never learned to play a musical instrument because I was always busy at the state. And, and so, you know, I just never was able to pick up a guitar or, or learn to play the piano. Uh, uh, but I appreciation for it. I'm, I mostly listen to the the rock and roll from from the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, when I was growing up. I mean, I I tell the story that, that my mother took me away in 1956 uh, to Stockholm. Remember the, the Olympics in 1956, the equestrian games were held in Stockholm, even though the Olympics themselves had been awarded to Melbourne, because in those days, the quarantine requirements were so stringent that none of the equestrian countries would have gone. I mean, the horses would have been away from home for over a year by the time they completed the, the entire process. So they moved the equestrian games to Stockholm, and we went to them. Uh, and when I went away, the local radio station was playing, you know, Lawrence Welk and Doris Day, um, these sort of vapid, uh, uh, sugary pop music uh, that was popular at that time. Uh, but when I came back, they were playing Gene Vincent in the Blue Caps and uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, singing Rock Around the Clock. Uh, and the, the rock and roll era arrived with a crash in Milford, Kansas, I must say. So that's, that's my musical background. My, the only instrument I can play is to be able to turn on a radio. Well, Jimmy, you mentioned your wife, Gail, of now more than 40 years. Take us back to when you met her and how you proposed to her. Uh, well, the, the meeting part is, is unusual. We, my brother, in the, in the summer of 1958, uh, my brother had taken quite a string of horses out to Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, and uh, I, I had finished school and had gone to visit a bit, and then they said, why don't you go out and stay with your brother because he needs help with the horses that are out there. And I said, that's fine. And somewhat unbeknownst to me, uh, my older brother, Jeb, had mentioned to some people that he had befriended that his uh, 13-year-old brother was coming to stay with him. And they said, oh, well, you must come for dinner on the 7th of July because uh, there is a uh, very, very cute girl, age 13, who lives right up the street from us, and she's absolutely horse crazy. And so this, of course, at age 13, meant, number one, it all went over my head, and number two, meant nothing <laughs> to me. Uh, until I, I walked in the door and turned and looked into the riveting room and saw Gail sitting alone on the couch uh, looking towards me. And I thought, well, that's funny. That's the girl I'm going to marry. And that, that was it. And, and indeed, I did. Well, so wonderful from the moment story. I saw her, I mean, love at first sight does does occur. Wonderful story. And at what age were you when you proposed to her, Jimmy? We were 13 when we met, uh, and we we corresponded. I went away to military school that fall. We corresponded, and then I would come out riding in Colorado, which had quite a uh, highly developed hunter jumper horse show circuit uh, during the summer at that time. Uh, so I could combine horses with Gordon Gale, and uh, I I proposed to her in the uh, let me see now. It would have been in probably November of 1965. So seven years later, uh, I proposed, and we were married June 11, 1966. Well, so what, 40, 44 what, years still what, working. A wonderful story, Jimmy, and uh, it, it's been a joy to hear your life story. And I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests on this series. At the end of the day, what matters most to you? Uh, just to take care of your horses and take care of your family. Wonderful. Jimmy, Jimmy, well, thank you so much for being a guest on this series. It's been a pleasure to uh, spend this time with you. I want to thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. I'm flattered to be here. My thanks again to Jimmy, and you can hear all the other guests in the series on both the Dressage and Jumping Radio shows this Thanksgiving week. And later in the year, 
the series will become its own podcast. So you can tune into that and listen to these truly inspirational people as part of that special podcast. Well, that about wraps it up this Thanksgiving week. Don't forget you can find us on eventingradio.com where the show notes are. You can follow us on Facebook, as always, where we have a fan page. And on Twitter, Horse Radio and Chris E. Stafford. Don't forget you can send me your comments, questions, suggestions and tips, anything that you'd like. Send those over to me at chris at horseradionetwork.com or post your comments on Facebook, of course. You can also reach me via voicemail at 270-803-0025. As usual, I would like to thank our sponsors, KPP and Professionals Choice, who make this show possible every week and don't forget to check out all the other shows here on the horse radio network well i will be back to same time same place so with more guests here on the eventing radio show so uh, until then thanks to all of you around the world for listening and to those of you in the u.s a very happy thanksgiving thanksgiving